Ravens Wrap. Brought to you by your local Toyota dealers. Geico. Bud Light. Ocean City Golf Club. JC Tickets. Comfort Inn. And by Ocean City Golf Getaway. Book your Ocean City Golf trip at OceanCityGolf.com. And hosted by the original Green Turtle. Welcome into a special edition of the original Green Turtles Ravens Rap Show right here at 47 ABC WNBT at 92.7 WGMD, Delmarva's News Talk and Sports Station. Broadcasting from the original Green Turtle, 116th Street and Coastal Highway in North Ocean City with Ravens News 44. And Ravens fans, give yourselves a hand. Welcome into week number eight of the 2017 NFL season. Week number seven for your three and three Baltimore Ravens. While we will do a brief preview of the Minnesota Vikings and take a look around the AFC North. Today, of course, is a very special show as we get a very unique perspective into the Ravens. This is the only owner in the National Football League that pretty much once a year, folks, comes to talk to us at our very neighborhood bar where we watch and root on our favorite team, of course, along with an adult beverage or two. We have the honor to watch once again, welcome Ravens owner Steve Bishotti to the program. Welcome, Steve. And the uh, Ravens Rap Show is brought to you by, of course, the original Green Turtle, our friends at buyatoyota.com, your official site for Toyota deals, our friends at Geico, Mud Light, the comforting Gold Coast, Ocean City Golf Club, Holiday and Express at Northside in Ocean City, RussellStreetReport.com, our friends at jctickets.net, which give us the tickets that we uh, raffle off during the season, and uh, also Ocean City Golf Getaway, the sponsor of Tony Lombardi's appearances right here on the Ravens Rap Show. Mike Bradley from 92.7 WGMD at 105. 5-7, the fan of Baltimore. To my uh, furthest left, we've got, of course, Tony Labardi, editor-in-chief of RussellStreetReport.com. Tony, welcome back, sir. Great to be here. Special night. And, of course, our special guest, Ravens owner, Steve Bishotti. And, Steve, i got to start out with yeah. Papo had Give a birthday. Up. Yeah. Papo had a birthday yesterday, and he kind of slipped me a note. He wanted to find out uh, what you got him. No. Uh, this. <laughs> this. There you go. <laughs> Fair enough. Fair enough. And, and also, I needed to ask because I, I do Maryland football network work, and I got to campus, and uh, apparently there's an AD job that may be open. I wanted to know, are you in the running for AD job? I know how big a Maryland guy you are. Any, any shot of that, Steve? No. no, no. <laughs> I have no interest. No interest? All Neither right. does my friend. Gary. <laughs> that's that's what I heard. That's what I, I heard. do remember you saying one year down here that they asked why you bought the Baltimore Ravens. You said because the Maryland University of Maryland wasn't for sale. <laughs> the basketball team wasn't for sale. <laughs> no. Well, and Tony, then, and then I found out half the college basketball was for sale. Yeah. yeah. <laughs> in some way, shape, or form. Yeah, right. right. Now we sat down in your office a couple of summers ago, and we talked about the future of the team, the the lease that was going to be coming up in you know maybe another 12 years. I think at that point it was. And I talked about your future. We talked about yours. And you said one of the things that was really difficult for you was in season that you really liked the off-season planning, shaping of the roster, and those kinds of things, but in-season was really hard for you, and you didn't see yourself being the owner when you're 75 years old. I still got 18 years <laughs> <laughs> to make that come true. But I mean, it, it's, it speaks a little bit to the difficulties of the job, and, and you know, the NFL is facing a lot of different things these years, and you think about, you know, we heard today TV ratings are down 7.5%. We heard that, you know, the, all these CTE issues, the things, the injuries on the field, it makes it even more difficult for you. Yeah, they, I mean, yeah they're, they're all big issues, and, and I would like to stick to football, but you can't, um, you know, you can't do this right. and, and avoid them. So uh, I've got some good guys there that take care of much of it and the rest of it. Uh, you know, it's, um, it, you, you can't avoid it. I mean, all those issues are there. They're not going away. And, um, uh, you know, we're usually very proactive in, in dealing with those. So uh, it's the things that I like the least. And, um, you know, I said during the season, I... Um, 
I, I, I'm like you all. You get excited. You get ner You know, you get excited during the week. You get nervous on the weekend, and then you want to kill yourself after a loss. <laughs> and um, that's why I like. I mean, I like building the roster because I'm a businessman. Um, I, I can't, re, you know, I, I I feel more in my element in the off season than I do in the regular season. I mean, that makes sense. And like you said, you're building a roster, you build businesses, and that's how you got to where you are. And you let your football guys do their thing when the season starts. Well, I mean, like Brandon Williams in the off season, a lot, you know, a lot of people questioned whether that was the best use of funds. And um, we had targeted him as somebody that we thought we needed to keep and we've got a lo lot of good players like Pierce that came out of nowhere did what they could do yeah undrafted and then you go without Brandon and we're getting run on so you know it's back like nada when we let go of nada it was because we had Brandon Williams right so um, I like the I like the building of the roster um, I, I like I like the communication uh, between the coach and the scouts um, um, that's the you know that's the beauty that's the luxury of 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 being the owner is I um, sometimes I'm a fly on the wall and sometimes I'm a fly in the ointment you know and that's different it's more up and down than it's ever been in the NFL because you, you look around I, I saw a projection I think it was an ESPN that if the Ravens were on the clock today with the draft they'd have the 11th pick at three and three and I think Mike was saying there's four Teams yeah. with three wins. It's crazy yeah. right now. Yeah, and if we had if we had won in overtime, then we'd have the fourth best record in the yeah, AFC. That, that, that's One right. game. Yeah. Right. Well, well, let me ask you to that point. I mean, Steve, you're into your 18th year in the NFL. Wow. The, <laughs> the last couple of years, when you look at injuries, when you look at um, the team not performing as well as you would have liked, etc., has this taken the most out of you in the last three or four years as compared to say the previous 14 years? Has it gotten tougher on a week-to-week -week basis? In a yearly basis for you? That, that's the hardest thing in the world for me to um, to try and figure out whether it's harder now. Mm -hmm. um, every game seems like the worst period in the world and we went into Oakland and I didn't have real high hopes because of the way we had played and then we looked great and I thought okay great I'll come and see Papo we'll be <laughs> Chicago and we'll be on a roll two, right? and everybody will love me and, <laughs> and and here I am and I'm sure Papo was waiting for a call on Monday morning saying I'm not coming but I had it was touch and go we weren't sure Steve yeah, yeah. <laughs> It, yeah, it's it's just hard. It's a it's a it's a hard thing to deal with, and um, uh, you know my family dies with me, my my friends die with me, and um, and you guys get to critique it from a less emotional spot. And I I know you're a fan, and I know you're supposed to be objective, and I appreciate the fact that you are a fan, and you enjoyed Super Bowl runs as much as most fans but when it comes down to lack of execution and poor decisions you're not involved in them so you can be very objective and and critical um, in a intelligent way and I can do that but I do that within the confines of my office so I can come up here and you know I wish I could be as open as you are but I can't because I I'm, I spent the day with Ozzy and John, and we're already looking at salary cap implications for next year. So before I flew out of here, the last thing I did was have a meeting with Eric and Pat and Ozzy and John, and we were sizing up 
next year's salary cap. Steve, we got about uh, two and a half minutes in this segment. Let me ask you this. You see that Sunday night you had an 0-5 New York Giants team without their top four receivers, a, su a suspect offensive line, a shaky defense. They go into Denver, one of the toughest places to play. They come out the winner. You've got a 30, 31-year-old head coach in uh, Sean McVay in L.A. who's off to a 4-2 and two start. Deshaun Watson, the first rookie quarterback to throw three touchdowns or more in his first three starts. It appears the NFL has maxed out as parity-driven as possible. Obviously, injuries are a great equalizer as well. Coming from a Ravens perspective, we saw the great run from 08 through 12. Can we ever realistically expect to have another run like that? Do we have to temper our expectations? Because there is so much parity in this league. A run like what? Like the one we had from 08 to 12 where we went to the playoffs or had a lot of winning seasons at least. Yeah, but that's that's looking back on a great run. But we dealt with the same criticisms when we came up short every year, except the year we won it. So I don't really look at it as a run. Um, I want to get back to the playoffs. We, we build the team with the idea of getting to the playoffs. But I don't look at it as a run because every single year except one, ended in disappointment so I can't Fair I can't look back and go god that was great because I was devastated every single year and felt that we had failed and I don't go oh check it off another year that I made the playoffs that that I'm, I'm not in this for the playoffs I'm in it for the Super Bowls and you know I was interviewed I was forced to do a few interviews um, down in New Orleans and I told Kevin Byrne I wanted them all together because I was not going to grant a bunch of interviews and I sat with the the, the best people at US uh, USA Today and ESPN and all the nationals and I made them do it all together and when they said, you know, you're in the Super Bowl for the second time in 12 years, and I said, you know, being here is all great, but if we walk out of here with a loss, then we fail. And I don't, so I, if, if, we, if we win, then we're a team that's won two Super Bowls, and if not, then we're a team that has won one Super Bowl. All right, we'll pick it up. More to come next. Keep it here. It's the original Green Turtles Ravens Rap Show. Welcome back in to the original Green Turtles Ravens Rap Show right here, 47 ABC WMBT at 92.7 WGMD, Delmarva's News Talk at Sports Station and home, of course, of Baltimore Ravens football. Coming to you from the original Green Turtle, 116th Street at Coastal Highway in North Ocean City, where Ravens News 44. Give yourselves a hand. Mike Bradley, Tony Lombardi, and our special guest, Ravens owner, Steve Bishotti in the house tonight. Give a round of applause. So just quickly, coming up, we've got uh, the Minnesota Vikings, a 1 o'clock kickoff. Just a quick synopsis, then we're going to move on. Uh, the Vikings come in on the season at 4-2, and two, a win over New Orleans. They lost to uh, Pittsburgh, uh, defeated Tampa Bay. They lost to Detroit, and then two straight wins, divisional games, Chicago and Green Bay. Of course, most of that Green Bay game uh, was without Aaron Rodgers. Also for Minnesota, Case Keenum at quarterback now. Sam Bradford, he might be done for his career, actually, at this point. Uh, Dalvin Cook, their rookie running back out of Florida State, done for the year. So Jarek McKinnon and Latavius Murray, the two guys in the backfield. Uh, Adam Thielen, Stephon Diggs, a Maryland grad, although he's been hurt the last couple weeks. Uh, Kyle Rudolph and then McKinnon out of the backfield are your receiving threats. And in terms of defensively, guys, they got a top five defense. They're third against the run, 14th against the pass. It's a very good front seven. So the Ravens offensive line will be tested in that one. And then uh, the Vikings come in with the 10th overall offense as uh, the Ravens look to get back on track to four and three in the uh, AFC North uh, trailing the uh, Pittsburgh Steelers. And uh, Tony, I'll let you take it with our news and notes segment here this week. A lot of things going on and some really interesting questions concerning some players too. Well, some off the field stuff and some injury notes. The, the Brandon Williams, we've missed him a lot over the past few weeks. He practiced today, so he might be a go this coming Sunday. That's going to be a big boost to the defense. Jalen Hill, a guy that looked really, really good during the preseason. He practiced, he was a full participant today as well, so that's 
a good thing for the Ravens secondary. And Carl Davis helped with that rotation uh, on the defensive front. Right. He's going to he practiced full today as well. Maurice Kennedy, a guy who looked really good during training camp, he's now working his way back. He might be one of those guys they bring back bring back from injury reserve. Stephen Johnson, inside linebacker, played for the black and gold for a couple of years. He's going to be a Raven now. He's going to he's on the right side of things now. <laughs> And uh, just found out today that Griff Whalen, he was in training camp with the Ravens as a wide receiver. He's being brought back into camp. Steve could probably tell you more about that, but maybe that's news to you. I don't know. But he's, he's being re he's being re I hope not. <laughs> <laughs> You're paying him. <laughs> <laughs> so and, and one more thing I wanted to mention, too, is that heading into the season, there was a lot of talk about the Ravens getting a new center. And there was a lot of talk about getting the guy from the Jets, name Mangle. escapes me, Nick Mangle, right. This is out. And Nick Mangle never became a Raven to the dismay of a lot of Ravens fans. But I want to let you guys know that the number three ranked center in the NFL right now is your Ryan Jensen by Pro Football Focus. So he's really stepping up and playing really well this year. <laughs> So, but you know, a lot of these things happen because of injuries, Mike. And and Steve, I wanted to get your thoughts on this. You know, we, we look around the Ravens over the last three years, probably the most injured team in the NFL. And you know, and then you look around the league, you see guys like J.J. Watt being injured, Aaron Rodgers, all these big names, and it really detracts from the product on the field. And I'm wondering if, as an ownership group, your partners and whatnot, if you're looking at this situation and saying, you know, are our fields are we grooming these fields the right way? Are our shoes the right way? Are these athletes not being trained the right way? You know, are we trying to help them heal the right way? I'm sure this has to be a big, big thing amongst your, your constituents. It, it is. And honestly, I, I, I go back to the, the lack of football practice in August. I mean, if I've got to put my finger on one thing, um, we're having football injuries significantly more, I believe, in September than December. And I think that that has to do a lot with our preparation for the season. And it doesn't mean that we wouldn't lose them earlier because you might lose some of them in August. But I'm seeing guys go down um, and I can trace it back to 40 hours of work or 20 hours of full contact practice when it used to be 150. And so I, I'm... You know, it, in the next CBA, I, I, there's two things that I think we need to do. I think we need to get back to more padded practices. And I think that we probably have to expand our roster. Um, number one on the 53 and number two on the 45 game day. I mean, to me, that's ridiculous. And that's such an archaic rule that there were bad teams that thought that you could, that if they, if the good teams had more players, then they could even be better than the bad teams, which again, makes no sense to me. It's like uh, a participation trophy. Yeah. And so we're picking up, we're picking up guys on the street street like Johnson who Jerry Rosberg wanted earlier on and we didn't have a chance to get him and now he comes available and now we've got him but if we had a, a roster of 60 and a game day of 55 then I think that these guys would flourish more I think that they'd play better I think that they'd understand schemes better and I think the product on the field would be better so I'm, I'm a big proponent of expanding the rosters, and that's got to be that's got to be initiated through the collective bargaining agreement. You know, a lot, I know a lot of people thought that not having that contact during training camp probably, you know, you hear the players even say it, I need to get into football shape. I might be yeah. a sculpted athlete, but I need to get into football shape yeah. and playing shape. So how do you, you're going to get pushback from the, the Players Association on that. It's going to be a hard thing to get back to where you guys used to be in terms of contact during training camp. And, the, and, and so then we have to give up something else. And I don't really know what that is right now. 
but I think that some of the players are starting to come to the conclusion that and, and another thing is the practice squad you know why should we expose our practice squad to other teams I think that you should have a 10 man practice squad and I think that you should be able to secure five of them that can't be plucked from your team. We draft a fifth round pick in April because of his potential. And we know that if we work with him, he can become a Ryan Jensen. But you can't protect him because he's not ready in August. And so you put him on the practice squad. We took a guy, Snacks Myers, remember him? Yes. Fifth round yes. pick. We really liked him. And uh, we worked with him by August end of August we knew he wasn't ready we put him on the practice squad said a prayer that he wouldn't be taken and then Denver takes him they put him on the, the their 53 he never gets a snap then they release him then he goes to another team and goes on their practice squad then they release him then he works out for three other teams I think he makes one of their practice squads for a week and I believe he's out of football now we can look him up. I don't know where he is. But the bottom line is that's the perfect example of a fifth round pick that you should be able to draft and then develop over the course of a year and no other team can take him. So that would make him a much better player if we could limit how other teams can steal those players. Right. And if they had an expanded roster with protected players, they wouldn't have to. We've, we've tried to get guys on practice squads and then and because we're banged up at linebacker so we keep a linebacker that we know isn't as good as the offensive linemen but our, our starting offensive linemen are healthy mm -hmm. so you you keep the linebacker because you're banged up and then you lose the offensive linemen and then you have two injuries at offensive line and you don't have the kid that you just worked with for six months it's stupid so to me I'm more into the expanded roster and let the the injuries take care of themselves. Well, and, and Steve, to that end with preseason, because I know there's been a lot of debate about that, and maybe I'm more old school, but to me, at minimum how three... How old are you? <laughs> <laughs> Fair enough. <laughs> but, you know, we go to this every school. week. I like that. <laughs> <laughs> uh, youngest guy on the panel. Fair enough. <laughs> but in terms of... Uh, in terms I of wish of that wasn't the case. <laughs> <laughs> with, the, with the preseason, I know a lot of folks don't like the four games, etc., but I've made the argument though and I understand about keeping your starters out to a certain extent not wanting them to get injured but at the same time to your point you can't take the physicality out of football the less these guys practice in the preseason means the rustier they are for the beginning of the year and I, I get it 32 teams have to deal with it but at the end of the day that potentially affects your wins and losses at the beginning of the year how do you come down on the preseason to me I, I think it's needed the four games or at least those starters need to play more well that's interesting because that goes back to a because, like I said, this is all CBA negotiated. And honestly, I could deal with, you know, I think that if you asked me to guess where we'll be five years from now, I think it'll be two preseason games, 17 regular season games, two bye weeks, and protect your practice squad. Then you don't, then you don't necessarily need the four games to make those critical decisions at the end of whether you keep that fifth rounder or you hmm. or you put him on the practice squad and expose him yeah. to being taken. So I we, we could probably live with two preseason season games if we were able to to protect our practice squad. Yeah. So to me they all they all line up and say okay we can accomplish more with less. Right. And if you got two if you got two bye weeks that would also be healthy for these players. Players. And then we expand the season two weeks. The regular, you know, the regular season is it goes goes one more week with an extra bye week, another week with a 17th game, and then we make the more money, and then that's how we make concessions to the players and the and the and the uh, in the CBA. We've got uh, 30 seconds. It actually used to be back in the day you had two bye weeks if you if you remember that took place. Tony, real quick here as we wrap up the radio. TV segment, your prediction for Sunday. <laughs> Putting you on the spot. <laughs> we got
got 10 seconds. Oh, he's a <laughs> Minnesota, 23. Ravens, 13. All right. <laughs> I tell you what, it's we'll score. T we'll we'll score 24 and beat that prediction. I will so you'll, say this: you can be right by I'm him. one in five this year in predictions. So everybody seems there happy about that. All right, we've got more to come. So Rich Hill, Green Turtles, Ravens, Rap Show. Keep it here. <laughs>